And we are ready for our next speaker, Carlos Canto, who, um, who's actually a hero of mine. You know, he's, he was very inspiring in the NAD uh, field that I sort of came into by random chance a little bit. So I'm very happy that you're here, finally. I think it's the first time we meet in person, actually. Although we're part of a consortium now. Um, but uh, very happy. Come up on the stage, please. <laughs> and let's welcome him. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Morten. Uh, also, you're one of my heroes, uh, <laughs> and many of you in the audience, so it's always a pleasure to see you. Uh, during the next 15 minutes or so, I will be discussing a little bit of the work that we've done on NED precursors. And uh, as a way of introduction, uh, I'll show you this cartoon, if I manage to change the slide, good. This cartoon that shows the rationale behind NED boosting therapies. So, as you might remember, uh, the textbook explanation is that the NAD is used as a redox cofactor, NAD and ADH, yet uh, we also know that NAD can serve as a substrate for degradation for multiple families of proteins. So, here's the NAD molecule. Oh, should it be here? No? Uh, well, somehow it doesn't work. In any case, you can see here the NAD molecule, and what we know so far is that it can be degraded by a number of... Okay, excellent. Excellent, thank you so much. By a number of families of enzymes. Among them, sirtuins, uh, uh, ARTDs, also a number of NADases. So these enzymes are extremely important for DNA repair, transcriptional regulation, immune function. So they are all the time working, and this has two implications. The first one is that since we are all the time consuming NAD, we need to have activities to rebuild these NAD levels. And the second implication is that NAD consumption is not necessarily constant. So for example, if we have an insult, a genotoxic stress, we will need more DNA repair and therefore more, more need to synthesize NAD. So of course the question is how do we synthesize NAD? And the classical way to do it is by providing NAD precursors. So we have the different molecules that can serve as NAD precursors, tryptophan, nicotinic acid, nicotinamide, nicotinamide riboside. And uh, if you think about yeast, uh, uh, worms, uh, elephants, uh, humans, we've all conserved extremely well the ability to use all this panel of molecules to synthesize NAD. And the question that we wanted to tackle in the lab is, why so many? Why did we need to evolve and use so many different molecules? Why not just one or two of them? Why not nicotinic acid or nicotinamide, which are relatively abundant uh, in, in, in the diet in terms of absorption? So the way we try to approach this question is, let's try to figure out uh, or know a little bit more about nicotinamide riboside metabolism. And let's try to see if we can identify are there unique functions to it, and if so, is this the better compound or not to use for clinical trials or for human subjects later on? So the way that we analyzed nicotinamide riboside function, it's quite simple. Nicotinamide riboside, once transported into the cell, requires the activity of uh, nicotinamide riboside kinase 1 to be transformed into an AD. Nicotinamide riboside kinase 1, it's quite widely expressed across our body, even if uh, the liver and the kidney show the highest expression. But of course, the need and the essential need for this enzyme makes it really easy to us to evaluate uh, the potential actions and physiological roles of nicotinamide riboside. The way we did it was simply to knock out nicotinamide riboside kinase 1, so we generate an NRK1 knockout mice. And uh, then, of course, uh, we can take primary hepatocytes from these mice and analyze the impact of deleting NRK1 in uh, NAD synthesis. So here we are measuring NAD in uh, uh, primary hepatocytes from wild type or NRK1 knockout mice. And what we can see is that uh, in normal baseline levels, not much happens. So not having the ability to use nicotinamide riboside doesn't affect your baseline NADs by any mean. Yet if we treat uh, wild type hepatocytes with uh, nicotinamide riboside, we see that NAD goes up really nicely, yet this is completely blunted in the NRK1 knockout hepatocytes. If instead of nicotinamide riboside, we use nicotinamide or nicotinic acid to raise NAD, the NRK1 knockout mice respond perfectly well. So in a nutshell, what we've done is to generate a knockout mice model that can use all common NAD precursors except for NR. So you can synthesize NAD from anything but NR. 
And the rationale behind that, again, is that if we see a phenotype on these mice, then we can assume that there might be a physiological, unique physiological role for nicotinamide riboside that cannot be covered by the other NAD precursors. So how do they look, these mice? So the NRK1 knockout mice look very boring in general. So they have no major phenotypes. Yet, when they begin to be between eight, 10 months of age, which is why generally I call the midlife crisis for, uh, for mice, we begin to see some effects over there. We begin to see that they begin to show pancreatic beta cell dysfunction. They also show uh, or begin to show fibrosis, especially in kidney and liver tissue, and a number of other complex phenotypes. So there's something going on with nicotinamide riboside kinase 1 or nicotinamide riboside metabolism. Yet, of course, this looks like a really systemic uh, global problem that, uh, that it might be difficult to tease out what might be the root and what might be the mechanisms. Also, I have a Y chromosome, so such a diverse panel of things is difficult for me to integrate. So we made it much simple. We made a liver-specific knockout, so a mouse that only lacks NRK1 in the liver. And what you can see here is that, again, normal circumstance, uh, normal, normal diet, no deficiency in NAD, yet, when we put these mice on a high-fat diet, we see that they begin to struggle. Any of the levels cannot be sustained on the NRK1 knockout lines. So this inability to sustain any levels was accompanied by also metabolic defects. So if we look on a, on a low-fat diet and we look at glucose metabolism, here's a classical uh, glucose tolerance test, insulin tolerance test excursions. What you can see is that on the normal diet, no changes. The NRK1 knockout mice and normal mice just look alike. Yet when we put them on a high-fat diet, the NRK1 knockout mice, what we see is that they have marked glucose intolerance. And also what we see is that they are less responsive to insulin. So they have glucose intolerant, and they're probably glucose intolerant, sorry, insulin resistant. They have a, a number of mitochondrial problems uh, that I'm not going to, to show today, but mostly related to complex one. And what we also see here, probably also as a consequence of these mitochondrial problems, is that uh, the livers are heavier, are, are much bigger. And this is completely due to fatty acid accumulation, so to triglyceride accumulation. Here we see uh, the accumulation of triglycerides measured by enzymatic means. Also through histology, you can see that high-fat diets prompt fat accumulation. This is exacerbated when uh, we are in the situation of uh, NRK1 liver knockout mice. And the increase in fat accumulation is also uh, uh, goes hand in hand with a number of other problems. If we look at histology from the liver, we can see higher amounts of fibrosis, higher amounts of apoptosis, and also higher amounts of compensative proliferation on these livers. So the NRK1, mouth, NRK1 knockout mice have a really uh, dysfunctional liver up to this point. So summarizing this really quickly, what we came out was, was this kind of scheme over here that is depicted on this cartoon. So in normal circumstances, in a healthy state, you might have so many needs, and these are generally, at least in mice, but we believe also in humans, these are pretty much well covered by the main NAD precursors that you see through your diet, which are nicotinamide and nicotinic acid. We might be, have challenges in our life and that we may make through a high-fat diet in mice. We know that this will increase NAD needs, and that's probably where the nicotinamide riboside branch might play in a role. And if, for example, as we did uh, in our case, we uh, disbalance the balance here, in this case by knocking out NRK1, so taking out this point of equation, and NAD needs clearly surpass uh, the ability to synthesize NAD through nicotinamide or nicotinic acid, then is when we enter into overt disease. The implication from this scheme is that, uh, fine, I mean, we have this situation in NRK1 knockout mice, uh, but these mice can still use this precursor, so why not just simply give him more of those until the balance is put right back into place? And that should recover the phenotype. And that's what exactly we were expecting, and that's why we did the experiment. So again, we went to the animal house, we put our mice on high-fat diet, or NRK1 knockout mice in high-fat diet. Then we supplemented them with heroic amounts of nicotinamide, uh, and we evaluated if this would improve glucose metabolism and mitochondrial function in the NRK1 knockout mice. The surprise that we found out is that the NRK1 knockout mice were equally bad in glucose tolerance with or without nicotinamide supplementation. We did the same experiment also with nicotinic acid, and again, the same thing. Neither nicotinamide nor nicotinic acid could recover the phenotype of the nicotinamide riboside knockout mice. And this was extremely puzzling to us, yet through uh, the utilization of um, metabolomic experiments, we managed somehow to provide some answer on why nicotinamide or nicotinic acid supplementation does not get to recover the phenotype. 
So I'm not going to drone you into infinite amounts of data and two years of frustration, but uh, the global scheme looks like this, and, and this already has been partially published, and uh, the rest will be published really soon. So in a healthy, normal state, if uh, we give oral, uh, orally uh, isotopically labeled nicotinamide, what you can see is that a lot of this nicotinamide will go and label NAD. So nicotinamide will be used to synthesize NAD. That's totally fine. But in a number of circumstances, or in this case, uh, the excess of nicotinamide will probably methylate it and then excrete it. And uh, since with nicotinamide we can cover NAD, this branch of NR is probably dispensable to be healthy. However, what we saw in the metabolic disease state is that when we were, again, orally giving nicotinamide, uh, isotopically labeled nicotinamide, uh, what we saw is that the, the labeling of NAD was extremely reduced. So nicotinamide struggled to actually be used to, be, to synthesize NAD. And it was largely diverged, diverged to methylation, into methyl nicotinamide, and then excretion. And probably that's why then this branch comes into relevance over here. And a very similar case I can make for, uh, for uh, nicotinic acid. If we or, uh, give uh, orally um, uh, isotopically labeled nicotinic acid, uh, it will be also methylated uh, to trigonelline and then excreted. This doesn't mean that no nicotinamide can make it into NAD. We still see labeled as NAD. It's simply that the ability to synthesize NAD from nicotinamide or nicotinic acid, it's impaired in the circumstances. So if we look at the picture right here, what I've been telling you is that, uh, well, they have some unique properties as NAD precursors, and the situation of metabolic disease, probably nicotinamide riboside will give you some advantages versus the other ones. Yet, uh, if you're more or less aware of the situation with uh, nicotinamide riboside in the clinic, uh, you know that it has been, uh, uh, how to put it simply, uh, it didn't meet the expectations probably created in, in preclinical models. And uh, the question is why didn't it do that? And there are two reasons for that, at least. The first one we described in 2016, uh, and, and it's quite eluded, but we were the first one publishing and describing that NR is heavily degraded in circulation. So even if we provide intravenously nicotinamide riboside, we can see that in less than two hours it's completely destroyed. And uh, the, the work from Joshua Rabinovitz and other labs also have even shown that even on the GI it's heavily degraded. So the first point is that NR is really poorly bioavailable, and probably this advantage that you might have with NR versus the other precursors might be lost because it's heavily degraded, and it's indeed degraded to nicotinamide, which, as I showed you, might be impaired. Second limitation is that even if uh, it goes into circulation, even if we manage that, I'll show you that uh, nicotinamide riboside requires NRK1. NRK1 is heavily expressed in the kidney, in the liver, but relatively poorly in other tissues. So, if, for example, if we are targeting the brain, if we are targeting muscle, maybe nicotinamide riboside will not give you a selective advantage over there. So, at this point is when we link to, uh, to one of our collaborators, uh, Professor Marie Migo, and we said, can we maybe try to find a way to tweak the NR molecule so that it still synthesizes an AD, uh, yet it's not degraded in circulation. And uh, th that's how we came into this molecule uh, after testing multiple molecules, and eventually we stumbled into this one called dehydronicotinamide riboside, or we call it NRH. As you see, the molecule is exactly similar as NR. The only difference is that NR has three insaturations in the nicotinamide ring, while NRH has only two. So the compound became interesting uh, at least for three reasons. The, the first reason is that it was not degraded in, in, in plasma. So, okay, that, that the first criteria we met it. This compound is not degraded in plasma. The second reason is that it was not a chemical artifact. Uh, NRH can be detected. We can detect it in liver homogenates from mice. We can also detect it in human urine. So it's a compound that we actually see uh, physiologically. And the third point, which was absolutely unexpected, is that it's an extremely powerful NAD uh, precursor. So here we see the classical uh, dose response or time course experiments comparing NRH to NR. And what you can see is that the NRH has an extremely powerful uh, ability to synthesize NAD, roughly 50-fold more powerful than NR. Also in the time course, we can see that the effects are extremely quick. Five minutes uh, in cultural cells already give you very significant amounts of NAD. So, Second surprise was uh, it's powerful uh, probably because it uses a completely different metabolic route towards NAD. 
So uh, tryptophan, nicotinic acid, nicotinamide, nicotinamide riboside, they all use their own paths. We believed at the beginning that uh, NRH was so similar to NR that it would use the same path, but it's not the case. And uh, we described in 2019, and later this was confirmed by, by Professor Sobe from Cornell, that the first step for an NRH metabolism is a phosphorylation catalyzed by adenosine kinase that then drives this path toward NAD. So we gave NRH to mice just to see uh, what could happen. Was this oral value available at all? And what you can see is that indeed, if we give orally NRH, we can see that we can synthesize, in, sorry, increase NAD in the liver really nicely. We can detect NRH in circulation roughly at the micromolar level, so which is compatible with the effects that we see in vitro in terms of NAD synthesis. That's really good. And not only that, uh, whenever we give orally NRH, uh, the other thing we did, we did was uh, use, uh, again, isotope labeling. So when we do that, what we can see is that NRH goes to any tissue we've uh, scouted on the body. So uh, unless, uh, for example, nicotinamide riboside, where we see nice incorporations in the liver or in the kidney, here we can see also that it, it goes to the brain, it goes to the muscle, it goes to the pancreas, it goes to, to the lungs. Any tissue we've checked, it goes there. So with this in mind, what we said is, uh, well, so far we have a really interesting uh, new precursor. Let's, is it therapeutic at all? So uh, what we did was just to take the really, uh, I would say, general approach of just going with a high-fat diet paradigm where we have our controlled mice, high-fat diet-treated mice, and then high-fat diet-treated mice that, that we uh, treated with uh, 100 or 400 milligrams per kilogram per day of uh, NRH. And then after eight weeks, we looked at what happened to them. So uh, these precursors were given uh, through drinking water, and as you can see here, they didn't drink more or less, they drank more or less the same, uh, all the groups, so there was no taste aversion, apparently, on the drinking water. And uh, when measuring uh, NRH in plasma, we can see that uh, it, we had uh, the expected uh, and, and really nice dose-response effect. So NRH was increasing as expected. So in terms of body weight, what we saw is that uh, whenever we engage into a high-fat diet, of course, the mice gain weight. And this was, uh, I would say, quite nicely prevented by NRH either at 100 or 400 dose. So that was nice. So we can prevent uh, high fat diet induced body weight gain to a large degree, not entirely. Second thing is that uh, we could also prevent some of the counter effects of high fat diet, which is, for example, uh, dysregulation of glucose metabolism. So here we see uh, on the fed state uh, blood glucose levels that uh, between the high fat diet and the NRH treated mice are more or less the same. Yet uh, NRH 400 especially, we could see that uh, after six hours of fasting, uh, blood glucose levels were nicely normalized in the 400 dose, yet uh, on the high fat diet still they remain really high. So as the last couple of slides that I will show you, uh, just some effects on some different tissues. Here's, for example, on the liver. Uh, and what we could see is that uh, uh, in line with the prevention of body gain weight, we could see that uh, there was less fat accumulation in the liver. So here we see that the high fat diet leads to fat accumulation. Here is uh, already staining. So the, red, the more red, the more fat you have. Uh, and you can see that uh, on the 100 or 400, almost in a dose response way, again, we can prevent fat accumulation. We also uh, improve mitochondrial function uh, with NRH, and here we see some profiles, for example, for uh, AST or for LDL cholesterol, which are normalized by NRH treatment. And uh, when it came to, uh, to genetic traits, or to, sorry, transcriptional traits, what we could see is that uh, especially uh, genes related to fatty acid catabolism were the ones upregulated by NRH. And the uh, final slide on this is that uh, when, uh, for example, we examine brown adipose tissue, again, we see some kind of parallel uh, effect. So with high fat diet, we increase fat accumulation in the, in the brown adipose tissue. This is, uh, again, those responsibly reverted by NRH. Again, also recovering mitochondrial function. Uh, used to be one expression also nicely responded to NRH. And also, again, fatty acid catabolism going upregulated with NRH. So to not overwhelm anybody on the audience, I will leave it here for today's presentation. Uh, Summarizing what I've been telling you uh, up to this point, we know that uh, in situations of metabolic disease, and we presume that uh, in situations of, of uh, physiological decline, not necessarily aging, physiological decline uh, uh, organisms, we might find that uh, the action of nicotinamide and nicotinic acid might be slightly compromised because uh, it needs a cofactor called PRPP that we uh, might be deficient on these circumstances. Uh, NR might provide some advantages, yet it's sensitive to degradation. So in some way, we fall down into the same pitfall as, as these other two. And NRH might 
be a promising alternative. Yet, of course, I don't want to overpromise here. We have no idea on the toxicity of NRH so far. And also, I mean, as discussed yesterday on the, on the panels, uh, all these NADP courses have been working really nicely in mouse models. We'll see what happens in humans, maybe in a year from now. So <laughs> we'll see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for a great talk. I, I, I'll start. I'm sorry. Um, so in some of the DNA repair disorders where we see PARP activation and we think that drives NAD decline, the, the major phenotype we see in, in patients uh, here are uh, actually what a kind of mitochondrial disorder. So you get uh, neurodegenerative phenotypes, maybe also muscle uh, mm -hmm. degeneration or muscle weakness. It's, it's, um, have you looked at NRH in relationship to muscle or brain? Uh, yes, so, so no, we've looked in relation to muscle. We don't see major effects in muscle at all, okay. <laughs> so, which has been really disappointing because we know NRH reaches the muscle, but, uh, but for some reason the muscle, either it's really well fed with, uh, with NAD, and, and when I say well fed with NAD, I mean that you need an extremely uh, dramatic reduction in NAD levels to create a mitochondrial or muscle dysfunction. These are the experiments that, for example, Anu has done uh, with, her, with his patients or that you have done previously. Probably if you decrease uh, NAD by 80-90%, then it's when you see the dysfunction. But uh, maybe a 50% decrease in NAD is not enough to see dysfunction here. So that's why probably muscle we safeguard it really nicely. Brain, we will have to look at it. But so far, we haven't. The only thing that uh, maybe uh, I wanted to mention in relation to what you've been saying is that uh, quite often um, the advantages of these NADP courses have been linked to uh, the activation of sirtuins and uh, the old fame of sirtuins and longevity. On the NRK1 knockouts, we don't see deficient sirtuin activity. What we see is deficient PARP activity. Mm. So we believe that the phenotype is because of deficient PARP activity okay. rather than anything okay. else. Very interesting. Mm. Thank you. Anu? Thank you. I really like your kind of approach of comparing the different precursors. So, as you know, we use nicotine acid for, for <coughs> patients uh, who had an absolute NAD deficiency, mm -hmm. increasing NAD for eightfold in the blood and not really in the muscle. However, if we look at mitochondrial biogenesis, it was remarkable in the muscle. So, I guess there is also the matter of NAD flux. So, have you thought about, uh, or have you, do you have a way to, to measure NAD flux in? Oh, 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 well, I mean, uh, there are two ways. There's the, the good way and the, the cheap way. So the good way, I mean, uh, it's, uh, I mean, this has been done by Joshua Rabinovich uh, extensively, and uh, I don't think anybody can compete with them at this point. They have done the best assays, and all their literature with Joe Bauer, it's absolutely incredible. I would say that in direct ways, more or less what you've done and many of us have done, which is uh, quicker uh, but a bit dirtier also, which is measuring a number of surrogate uh, metabolites from NAD, methyl nicotinamide, uh, methyl YXP, etc. So to analyze uh, somehow NAD catabolism also on, on the tissues. But going back to your point, um, uh, what we see with nicotinic acid in muscle, it's, it's always puzzling. And, uh, and this leads me to a quite important point. Uh, nicotine, uh, muscle doesn't express the activities that nicotinic acid requires to drive any synthesis. But what we know is that nicotinic acid can drive the synthesis of nicotinamide in the liver and also nicotinamide riboside somehow. When we inject mice with nicotinic acid, we see nicotinamide riboside being produced. So uh, there's something going on that we don't really understand right here on what's going on with these metabolites. And maybe what you see in the muscle, it's flux plus the creation of not just nicotinic acid, but an array of NAD metabolites that might be fitting into this. Very interesting. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the valuable lecture. Uh, I have one question. When we talk about high fat diet, can we ask what kind of fat do you give to the mouths? Because we have healthy fat and we have less <coughs> fat and uh, the high fat. As we know, as a nutritionist, a high fat diet, but with less carbohydrate, has a very uh, positive impact on human being on all the aspects. And, but uh, uh, of course, unhealthy fat is a big burden for mitochondrial activity. And of course, it can increase the, 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 the request for NAD more. Uh, and the second question, uh, when you say high fat, how much carbohydrates also with the fat? Because sometimes when you say high fat diet, and it's 50%, but 45% also carbohydrate. Of course, this is also the 
worst diet that you mm -hmm. give to the mouse, and whatever you expect from the mouth, I mean, to, to have a, a, a good health, of course, um, obesity and the other things. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your explanation. Okay. So for clarification, we, we've used two different kinds of high-fat diets uh, in, in our studies. Uh, we've been using uh, the classical from research diets, which I don't recall the number exactly, which is 60% uh, fat in them, uh, and then it's uh, sucrose match with the controlled diet. And then uh, for the later studies that we've shown with NRH, we are using a 40% high-fat diet with a little bit of cholesterol, 0.2% so cholesterol. Uh, because we wanted to tackle uh, specific topics in relation to fatty liver uh, next to this intervention. So for the carbohydrate concentration, I should look at it, uh, because I, I don't recall by memory exactly what was the carbohydrate concentration, but I, I can tell you later. I can look at it in a minute. Uh, all right. Sorry? From LART. Uh, no, it, it's from LART. I mean, it's, it's undefined at this point. All right. Thank you so much for your presentation. Very interesting.